glad to hear that. Men should always have an occupation of some kind. <laughs> there are far too many idle men in London as it is. Hello, Mark. Hello. Welcome back to the Cotswolds. Thank you very much for inviting me. Why did you choose this particular play to direct and work on? It's always been one of my favourites. It's always been something that I've thought about doing for a very long time. I studied it when I was at the Star Centre in Gloucester. I performed it as part of um, my experience at this, the Literature Festival there and played Jack. And so it's something I've had in my mind for a very long time, really. What is it like working on such a classic as Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest? It's very tricky because he's very verbal and it's all about the words, it's all about the breathing, it's all about the delivery of the line and it's all about finding the pauses and finding the gaps when you need to, to breathe. So there's actually a massive technique in order to deliver massive long pieces of dialogue which obviously you only discover once you're up and running. £130,000 and in the funds. Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. <laughs> Few girls of the present day have any real solid qualities, qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come over here, then. Have you had to make any alterations in the script so you could play Lady Bracknell with your disability? Yes, I mean, it's hilariously funny having someone play her with a disability because there's a big speech at the beginning of her entrance where she talks constantly about being ill or being an invalid or invalid, as she puts it, and she's terribly patronising about the whole issue of disability. So it, it's kind of ironic, really, and adds another level of comedy. How has the process been directing and acting at the same time? <laughs> I would say it's been very hard, um, having to wear two heads at the same time. And a lot of the time, um, I was really conscious of doing many things all at the same time. And it isn't really until the last week where we are now that I'm actually beginning to think of myself as an actor and not a director. So I'll be very happy once we're up and running and I don't have to think about a million things to do. I understand you've opened your own production company during the pandemic. I have, I have. It's called Drama Cop Productions, which is the Gaelic word for drama. And um, I set it up as a result of people saying to me for a long, long time, you should either open your own agency or you should open your own production company. And I decided the production company was the way forward. To, to consciously make an effort of employing both disabled and able-bodied actors working together so it will be a completely integrated company on every project, which I'm very excited about. You have lots of new exciting productions coming up for the rest of the year. Can you tell us about them? I do. After this, I'm going in to production of um, Talking Heads by Alan Bennett playing Graham Whittaker as in Chip in the Sugar and that's at the Chelsea Theatre in October um, which I'm directing and also working on and then I'm not directing A Christmas Carol at the Actors Church in November in Covent Garden. So I couldn't get any more removed from Lady Bracknell if I tried and it's been a he hell of a challenge the whole year to be going from one character to the next, really. I never thought when I put in the application that it would really happen. Thank you very much for joining us today and we wish you all the best of luck with your new production company. Thank you very much. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I'm doing very well, Aunt Augusta. That is not quite the same thing. <laughs> In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear me, Gwendolyn, you are smart. I'm always smart, am I not, Mr. Worthing? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. I fully intend to develop in 
many directions. <laughs> I'm sorry that we are a little late, Jerome, but I was obliged to call upon dear Lady Harbury. I have not been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you sit here, Gwendolyn? Lay. Yes, what? sir. Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered, ordered them specifically for Aunt Augusta. There were no cucumber sandwiches in the market, sir. I went there twice. No cucumber sandwiches? No, sir. Not even for ready money. <laughs> That'll do, Lay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm terribly sorry about there being no cucumber sandwiches. Not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. For I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. Indeed, I hear her hair in some quite doleful grief. It certainly has changed colour. From what cause, I of course cannot say. I have quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman, so attentive to her husband. It is a delight to watch them. I'm afraid I will not be able to dine with you on Thursday. You see, my poor friend Bunbury is not feeling very well. I hope not, Algernon. It will put my table completely out, and it will mean your uncle will have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. Yes, but I have received a telegram about my poor invalid, invalid friend Bunbury. He's not feeling very well. They seem to think I should be with him. It's very strange that this Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from incurably bad health. Elchibald, I think it is high time that this Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or die. <laughs> this chilly shallying with the question is quite absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of this modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle, but not that it takes much notice as far as its ailment goes. So I would be very much obliged if you could ask Mr. Bubbler from me not to have a relapse next Saturday. For I rely on you to arrange my music for me. And it is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season, when everybody has said whatever it is they have to say, which in most cases was probably not much. <laughs> I'll certainly try to speak to my poor friend Bunbury, if you're still conscious. And about the music, if one plays good music, people don't listen. If one plays bad music, people don't listen. Now, if you're kind enough to go into the next room with me, I'll happily explain the uh, music programme with you. It's very thoughtful of you, Algernon. I'm sure the music will be delightful after a few explorations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think they're improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. <laughs> But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed I believe it is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Papa.